It was the early 1990s, and the direct-to-video movie company Full Moon had been cranking out classic horror, fantasy, and sci-fi films to a growing audience of rabid fans. With numerous series going full steam, like Trancers, Puppet Master, and Subspecies, they were looking to branch out into something a little different. At the time, things were going great. The home video market was huge, and they couldn't make the movies fast enough to supply the demand. Production was on a roll. Full Moon was working in conjunction with Paramount, who wanted more and more product. Around this time, there was a huge buzz in Hollywood about Steven Spielberg directing the adaptation of the best-selling Michael Crichton book, Jurassic Park, which ironically began as a screenplay Crichton wrote in 1983. Full Moon head Charles Band had already read the book and was a big fan of Spielberg. Knowing the book and Spielberg, he was able to surmise that the film would most likely end up being PG-13. Band had been in the business for years and full well knew the concept of look-alike films. Movies that try to ape off another, often bigger film. We see this all the time. Jaws set off a wave of shark or sea creature movies. Twister started a boom of disaster movies. Now with Bohemian Rhapsody making a ton of money, you can expect a massive influx of musician biopics in the coming years. Anyway, lookalike films are movies with the same theme as a current blockbuster. Some lookalike films will go so far as to use a similar title. The Asylum made a variation of this, which was later called Mockbusters. They made this their business model, and it saved them from bankruptcy. Back to the 90s. Band was approached by Full Moon storyboard artist Pete Von Shelley. He was a dinosaur enthusiast who came to him with an idea. When he was younger, he had dreams of owning a pet dinosaur, and had the framework for what would be called Prehysteria, complete with the exclamation point. It was essentially Honey, I Shrunk the Dinosaurs. Band loved the idea. He's always had a fascination with puppets, and numerous films that heavily featured stop motion, as well as rod and cable puppets, so a movie with puppet dinosaurs greatly appealed to him. However, the concept for the film was something more aimed at kids, which was far from the content that Full Moon made. Knowing that Jurassic Park was coming out in less than a year, he thought it was a perfect opportunity to make Jurassic Park light. Jurassic Park was going to be PG-13, and they could make a PG film released around the same time aimed at the audience who was too young to see Jurassic Park. He recognized it couldn't be released under the full Moon label, and decided to come up with a sister label, Moonbeam. Moonbeam would be strictly sci-fi and fantasy films aimed specifically at a younger audience. Full Moon was filling the void of the home video market, and Moonbeam would be filling the even greater void of kids programming. He presented the idea to Paramount, who loved it. A week later, they had a deal, and Prehysteria moved into production. Roger Corman also saw the dinosaur buzz, but decided to make Carnosaur, an R-rated action horror film that was scheduled to be released right before Jurassic Park. Carnosaur, like Jurassic Park, was also based on a novel. Paramount had such high hopes for Moonbeam, they gave them some additional funds, making the budget for Prehysteria higher than any of the full Moon movies. Band spoke to Von Shelley about who should design the dinosaurs, and he suggested his wife Andrea. She was a sculptor who also had an affinity for dinosaurs. Von Shelley signed on to be a co-producer on the film and did the storyboards for the production. They started looking for their lead and found a young Austin O'Brien. He was 10 at the time, and had been acting since he was 3, doing mostly commercials. In 1992, he had a small part in his first movie, The Lawnmower Man, but Prehysteria would be his first lead. When he came into audition, they knew right away he was who they were looking for. Brett Cullen was hired to play Jerry's father, Frank. He was coming from TV series like Falcon Crest and movies like By the Sword. To play the evil Sarno, they hired Stephen Lee. Lee had worked with Empire and Full Moon before with the two Stuart Gordon films, Dolls and The Pit and the Pendulum. They hired Samantha Mills to play Jerry's sister, Monica, and Colleen Morris to play Frank's love interest, Vicky. Both were relatively new actresses. They planned on filming in mid-1992 in Full Moon Studios in Los Angeles, as well as location shoots in the general California area. The places they shot out of LA like Hanford were obviously much cheaper to film. Prehysteria was about a young kid named Jerry who was obsessed with Elvis. He discovers some oversized eggs that hatch into five diminutive dinosaurs. Jerry and his family are put in danger when a greedy museum curator tries to recover the dinosaurs so he can be rich, a pretty basic concept for a kid's movie. Family in danger, greedy, goofy bad guy, and dinosaurs. Something that parents could enjoy that also wouldn't be too scary for kids. Things were insanely busy at Full Moon at the time. Charles decided he would co-direct Prehysteria with his father and veteran director Albert. This wasn't a case of them directing at the same time, however. 
since Charles was still running the day-to-day -day business of Full Moon, he was only able to direct about half the planned days. They started filming a planned three-week shoot with Albert and Charles splitting the days down the middle. They were on a very tight schedule, which was compounded by the fact that they were working with a kid. Normally they'd shoot with actors for about 12 hours a day, but since O'Brien was only 10, he was only able to work about 6-7 to seven hours a day. He also had 3 hours a day that was dedicated to school. Since they were filming during the summer, it was very hot. The scene where they were shooting in the truck was incredibly hot. They had to put ice in the back of the truck for the dog since he was out in direct sunlight the whole time. The store and Sarno's connected office was a set. They used some props from previous full moon films to fill in the background. The jungle portion was filmed in the Los Angeles Arboretum. Since Jerry was obsessed with Elvis, they tried to get some of his music for the film. They couldn't, however, because licensing one of his songs would have cost a ridiculously large portion of the budget. So they got some sound-alike bands to put on the soundtrack because really, most kids wouldn't know the difference. Case in point, O'Brien had no idea who Elvis was when he was hired for the movie. To get into the character, he watched footage of Elvis and tried his best to imitate his lip thing. The dinosaurs were a combination of rod and cable puppets, with some moments of stop motion, although the pterodactyl was almost entirely stop motion. For some of the sets, they built them five feet off the ground so the puppeteers could control them from underneath. To increase the appeal to kids, they chose to make five different dinosaurs, each one from the most common group. The Brachiosaurus, Stegosaurus, Styracosaurus, Pterodactyl, and of course, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. When the pterodactyl was on Monica's shoulder, it was being controlled by remote. They kept the harness under her shirt to hide the mechanics. Mark Rappaport worked with the rod and cable puppets, while David Allen handled the stop motion work. For the wide shot where we see the dinosaurs in full for the first time, there were 10 to 12 puppeteers underneath controlling them. Some people have mistaken the little brown pebbles on the floor for dinosaur poop, but they were really raisins, since Jerry's dad was a raisin farmer. They named each of the dinosaurs after a famous musician at the time. Hammer for MC Hammer, Jagger for Mick Jagger, Paula for Paula Abdul, Madonna for, uh, Madonna, and Elvis. Elvis wasn't from the 80s and 90s, obviously, but the rare case of a musician whose work is timeless. Frank Welker, once again, provided his voice talents for all the dinosaur noises. After the shoot, they moved into post, where they spent a month doing additional dinosaur effects and the stop-motion work. Jurassic Park was released on June 11th, 1993. It opened number one at the box office and made over a billion dollars worldwide, making it the highest grossing film of the year. This set off a wave of dinosaur fever. Jurassic Park toys were flying off the shelves, and there was a renewed interest in dinosaurs, which is what Band was hoping for. Prehysteria was released on June 30th, 1993, and was huge. In the U.S. alone, it sold over 70,000 copies to rental stores, making it the most successful direct-to-video movie of the year. They even received an award for it. Shortly after finishing Prehysteria, O'Brien went off to shoot a little film called... Last Action Hero. Even though we filmed Last Action Hero after Prehysteria, Sony had an insane rush to get it into the theater, and it came out a week after Jurassic Park, and about a week before Prehysteria. There's a great story behind Last Action Hero I hope to be able to tell one day. Last Action Hero was a legendary flop, but O'Brien kept acting. He was in everything from My Girl 2, and expanded his role in Lawnmower Man 2, before settling into TV series like Touched by an Angel, and Promised Land. He now has kids of his own, and I can't imagine him not wanting to show them this. Cullen continued acting, and has become a very successful character actor, with over 140 credits to his name. Everything from Ghost Rider, to The Dark Knight Rises, to a TV series like Make It or Break It. The Moonbeam label was a verified hit, so Paramount greenlit more films under the sister label, in the hopes of repeating the success. They knew there was a serious lack of kids programming in the direct-to-video market, but the overwhelming success of Prehysteria proved even bigger than they imagined. They wanted to get as much out as quickly as possible. The next stop was a knockoff or look-alike of Home Alone called Remote. They also made Prehysteria 2 and 3, Beanstalk, Dragon World, Pet Shop, the Josh Kirby Time Warrior series, and many others. The films were doing very well for both Full Moon and Paramount. It was estimated the average Full Moon film had a budget of around $800,000, where the average Moonbeam film had a budget of about $1.3 After a few years, when direct-to-video sales had died down, 
Some new executives came on board at Paramount, and they ended their contract with Full Moon. Paramount still had the rights to the film, so they licensed the Moonbeam catalog out to the Disney Channel, where they played for years. As the direct-to-video market became oversaturated and less profitable, Moonbeam was shuttered after cranking out 19 films in four years. Over the years as Full Moon fell on hard times, Paramount hung onto the rights to Prehysteria. They did nothing with them. The film never made it past VHS and Laserdisc, except in Germany, where it had a small DVD release under the new title, Jurassic Kids. Thankfully, all these years later, the rights reverted back to Full Moon, and Band was able to take the original 35mm negatives and have a cleaned-up version released on Blu-ray. I just hope they can do the same for the sequels, and honestly, all the other Moonbeam films. As much as a fan of Full Moon as I am, I missed a bunch of them. Dinosaur Fever continued for quite some time, and while Corman's Carnosaur didn't do as well as Prehysteria, they still managed to make five of them, although four and five were mostly recycled footage from parts one, two, and three. Prehysteria is everything you would expect from a full moon movie aimed at kids. It's not as weird as Pet Shop, but it still has that certain charm that only 1990s full moon could deliver. It's lower budget, but not cheap. They shot on 35mm, so it looks great, and the practical dinosaurs look stupendous. O'Brien said there were times when he was holding Elvis that he forgot it wasn't real. Some of the compositing is a little off, but not so much that it ruins the film. I'll still take a bad stop-motion composite over a bad CG composite any day. If you're looking for a good dose of dinosaur-laden nostalgia, or you have a kid who's a bit too young to see the Jurassic Park series, Prehysteria will make both of you very happy. Say howdy, she just got kissed on the tush by the king. <laughs>